in this lecture. I want to look at an issue that arises when you try to apply Bayes' theorem. And I'm going to do that by looking at two important puzzles that involve Bayes' theorem. So as a reminder, here's Bayes' theorem. So the idea, the situation is you're interested in whether or not some hypothesis is true given some evidence, or rather you're interested in the probability of a hypothesis given some evidence you've observed. Now, typically, it's very difficult to figure out what this probability is, what this conditional probability is. But using Bayes' theorem, you can usually calculate it. So Bayes' theorem says the probability of H given E is equal to the probability of E given H. Now, this is the likelihood of observing the evidence, supposing that the hypothesis is true, times the prior probability of H divided by the prior probability of, the, of observing the evidence. Now let's consider a classic problem involving Bayes' theorem. So this is known as the three prisoners problem. Suppose that there are three prisoners, A, B, and C, and say that they've been tried for murder and their verdicts were, will be told to them tomorrow morning. So either they're guilty or innocent. They know, and this is commonly known among all, everyone, that only one of them will be declared guilty and will be executed while the others will be set free. The identity of the condemned prisoner is revealed to the very reliable prison guard, but not to the prisoners themselves. So the three prisoners know that exactly one of them will be declared guilty. The other two will be in declared innocent. The person to be declared guilty will be uh, 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 put to death. And they know that the reliable prison guard has been told which one of them will be declared guilty tomorrow morning. So currently they don't know who is innocent and who is guilty. Now, prisoner A asks the guard, please give this letter to one of my friends, to the one who's to be released we know that at least one of them will be released. So prisoner A says, I have this letter. I want you to give it to one of my friends. Please give it to the person that will be released. Everybody knows, it's completely well known among everybody, that at least one, one of the other people will be released. Now, an hour later, A asks the guard, can you tell me which of my friends you gave the letter to? It should give me no clue regarding my own status because regardless of my fate, each of my friends had an equal chance of receiving my letter. So the guard told him that B received his letter. Now prisoner A thinks the following. Prisoner A says to himself, well, B received my letter, so that means B must be innocent. There's only two people left, so my probability of being guilty is now 0.5. It's, there's a 50% chance that I'm guilty because there's only two of us left that have a chance of being guilty. But then A thinks to himself, hold on a second. Before I talk to the guard, my chance of being executed was one in three. There's about a 33% chance that I was executed. Now, B told me, or sorry, the guard told me that B has been released and only C and I remain. So suddenly, my chances of being executed have gone from 33% to 50%. But what happened? I made certain not to ask for any information relevant to my own fate. So what exactly happened here? Prisoner A asked the guard to give a letter to one of his friends, the prisoner and the guard, everybody knows that at least one of his friends is going to be released because only one person is going to be declared guilty. And then prisoner A said, well, why don't you just tell me who it is? We both know that at least one person is going to be released. And pr the guard said that I gave it to, to prisoner B. And then prisoner A noted that there's only two people left that have a chance of being guilty, so his probability went from 33% to 50%. However, the prisoner didn't receive any information that he didn't already know before, of, before this exchange. So something has gone wrong with A's reasoning. It can't be that 
A's probability or A's belief that he's going to be declared guilty went from 33% to 50% simply by receiving information that everybody knew that was public knowledge. Well, we can capture A's reasoning using Bayes' theorem. Consider these two propositions. So G sub A, this is just prisoner A will be declared guilty. Of course, the prior probability of GA is one-third. We're going to assume that the probability that each of the prisoners is going to be declared guilty is equal, so that since there's three prisoners, each has a one-third chance of being declared guilty. Let IB be the proposition prisoner B will be declared innocent. So we have the probability that B will be declared innocent is two-thirds. If you have a one-third chance of being declared guilty, that means you have a two-thirds chance of being declared innocent. Now, we have that if condition on the fact that A is declared guilty, of course the probability that B is declared innocent is one. That's the setup of the problem. Remember, the problem states that exactly one of the prisoners will be declared guilty. So if we know, or if we suppose that A is declared guilty, then with probability 1, B must be declared innocent. But now, if we plug this into Bayes' theorem, what we're interested in, A learns that B will be declared innocent. And we want to know, what is the probability that A is guilty given that B is innocent? Well, by Bayes' theorem, this is the probability that B is innocent given that A is declared guilty times the prior probability of A being declared guilty divided by the prior probability of B being declared innocent. But we can plug in these numbers. We see that this is equal to 1, the probability of B being declared innocent given that A is guilty is 1, the prior probability of A being guilty is 1 third, and the prior probability of B being innocent is 2 thirds. And if we do this calculation, this is 1 times 1 third divided by 2 thirds, which is equal to 1 half. So it seems like Bayes' theorem is justifying this incorrect reasoning. Remember, this reasoning is incorrect. It shouldn't be that by learning this information that A suddenly comes to believe that he now has a 50% chance of being de declared guilty rather than a 33% being declared guilty. So what has gone wrong? We applied Bayes' theorem. We got the seemingly wrong answer. Of course, Bayes' theorem isn't incorrect. So what, what exactly has gone wrong? Well, the issue is that we were conditioning on the proposition that B has been declared innocent. But this is, importantly, not the information that A received. What A received is that the guard said that B will be declared in. Now, of course, A trusts the guard, so A believes what the guard tells him. But changing from learning that B will definitely be declared innocent versus the guard said that B will be declared innocent is a crucial change. And why is that? Well, because we have to ask, what is the probability, given that A is guilty, that the guard said that B will be declared innocent? So what is that probability? Well, actually, we don't really know. It's not specified in the formula. We can assume that it's perhaps 50-50, because after all, if A is declared guilty, that means both B and C are innocent. So the guard has a choice. The guard can decide, do I want to give the letter to B or do I want to give the letter to C? Now, maybe the guard really likes B better or trusts B and so has a higher probability of giving the letter to B rather than to C. But given that we haven't specified what this probability is, a natural assumption is that given that A is guilty, the probability that the guard gives the letter to B, so, so reveals that B is innocent, is going to be one half. Now, if we use this information and plug this fact into Bayes' theorem, we have what's the probability that A is guilty 
given that the guard said that B is in it? Well, that's equal to the probability that B, the guard said B is innocent, given that A is guilty, times the prior probability of A being guilty, divided by the prior probability of the guard saying that B is innocent. Now, of course, we have to figure out what is that prior probability. One can use the law of total probability here, but intuitively, the prior probability of saying that any individual person is innocent or guilty should be 50%. So the probability that this conditional probability, the probability that the guard said that B is innocent, given that A is guilty, is one half. The prior probability of A being guilty is one-third, and the prior probability of, B, of the guard saying that B is innocent is one-half. And if we do these calculations, we see that the one-halves cancel and we get one-third. So the problem was not Bayes' theorem, but the application of Bayes' theorem. It's very important that you're very clear and precise about the propositions or events that you use when you apply Bayes' theorem to a real-life situation. This is very closely, closely related to a well-known puzzle called the multi Monty Hall Dilemma. So here's the story. Suppose that you're on a game show, and you're given a choice of three doors. So there are three doors here. Door one, door two, and door three. Now, behind one of the doors is a car, and behind the other doors are goats. And you're asked to pick a door. Say that you pick door number one. So this is the door that you pick. So you pick door number one. And the host, who knows what's behind the door, so the host knows where the car is and where the goats are, opens another door, say door three. So door three, this is opened by the host. And what you see behind this is, I'll draw a sad face, because you see a goat behind door number three. So door number three has a ghost, the host has opened it, and now the host says to you, do you want to pick door number two? So you have a choice now. You've chosen one. But you can switch. You're allowed to switch to door number two, or you can stay with door number one. So the question is, should you switch? Is it to your advantage to switch? Many people have thought about this problem. The immediate reaction is, well, no, there's no reason to switch because there's two doors that remain. The probability of the goat be, being behind one versus two is 50-50, so you should just go ahead and stay. It, do, it doesn't really matter if you switch because the probabilities are the same. That reasoning has been shown to be incorrect, and this should remind you very much of this prisoner's problem that we just went through. So let's set up the problem. We have three propositions, H1, H2, and H3. H1 means the car is behind door one, H2 means the car is behind door two, and H3 means the car is behind door three. Now here's the first reasoning. This will be the incorrect reason. Let E be the statement, the car is not behind door three. Now notice, not being behind door three, three, so not H3, is equivalent to saying that it is behind either door one or door two. That's the setup of the problem. If the car is not behind door three, it must be behind door one or door two. So let's use Bayes' theorem. So Bayes' theorem says, given the evidence E, given the evidence that the, the car is not behind door three, what's the probability that the car is behind door one? Well, this is going to be the likelihood that you receive this evidence, given that the car is behind door one, times the prior probability of the car being behind door one, divided by the prior probability of this evidence. So how do we calculate these probabilities? Well, to calculate the probability, the prior probability of the evidence, we need to use the law of total probability. And this is a slightly generalized version of the law of total probability than what, what we've seen so far. 
but it says that the probability of E, the probability that the car is not behind door three of receiving this evidence E, is the probability that it's behind door one times the probability that you, you receive evidence E given that it's behind door one plus the probability that it's behind door two times the probability that you receive this evidence given that it's behind door two plus the probability it's behind door three given that times the probability that you receive this evidence given that it's behind door three. So this is just the law of total probability. Now, what are these probabilities? Well, given that the car is behind door one, the probability that the car is not behind door three is, of course, one, because I've just told you the car is behind door one. Given that the car is behind door two, the probability that the, you have this evidence here that the car is not behind door three is also one. Given that the car is behind door three, the probability that you receive this evidence that the car is not behind door three is, of course, zero. The prior probability of the car being behind each of the doors is, of course, just one third. And the probability, and we've already seen that the probability of E given H1 is equal to one. And the prior probability of H1 is one third. So we get one third divided by one third plus one third plus zero is one times one third divided by two thirds, which is equal to one half. And we can do a similar calculation for the probability of H2 given E. So this way of capturing this reasoning suggests that you shouldn't switch. So applying Bayes' theorem in this way, it seems like you shouldn't switch. But of course, this reasoning is incorrect. Now, why is, well, maybe the, it's not, of course, this reasoning is, is incorrect. But we can see, in fact, that this reasoning, empirically, we can see this reasoning is incorrect. What do I mean by that? Well, here's a little simulation that I, I ran. And what I did is I just performed the experiment over and over and over again, uh, up to a thousand times. And I allowed, I, I, I let the person, um, uh, uh, I, I randomly selected where the cars were placed behind the doors. And I revealed uh, when the car wasn't behind door three, I revealed that there was a goat behind door three. And I allowed the player to, to play two strategies. One is the strategy to just stick with door one. And the other is to change, is to swap and to go ahead and to go with door two. Well, on average, overall, and we just calculated how many times did you actually win? we can see that by changing, the probability of winning is higher than the, pro than the probability of winning given that you stayed. So this suggests that there must be something wrong with this reasoning. This reasoning can't possibly be correct because we see that when we simulate this game, that changing turns out to be a better strategy than staying. Yet, it seems like applying Bayes' theorem suggests that you should go ahead and stay. Or not switch, rather. That's what stay means. Well, similar to the three prisoners problem, the issue here is that the evidence you received is not that the car is not behind door three, but rather that Monty, or the host, is the person that opened door three. Now, if this is the information you receive, so the information is that Monty said that the car is not behind door three, or Monty showed me that the car is not behind door three. How does that change our calculations? Well, given this evidence F, we need to figure out what is the probability of F given that the car is behind door two, because that's what we're really interested in. Well. Given that the car is behind door two, what's the probability that Monty will show me what's behind door three? Well, given that Monty is not going to show me where the car is, because that would give away the game. That would be a very boring game show if the host just simply showed you where the prize was. So under the assumption that the car is behind door two, Monty is definitely 
going to open door three. But here's the crucial bit of information. Given that the car is behind door one, what's the probability that Monty will show me door three? Well, the car is actually behind door one. That means Monty has a choice. He can show me either door two or door three. So we can assume that he's just going to flip a coin. There's a 50-50 chance that he'll show me door two or he'll show me door three. So given that the car is behind door one, the probability that Monty shows me that there's nothing behind door three or there's a goat behind door three is one half. And then the probability, if the car is behind door two, the probability that Monty shows me that there's a goat behind door three is, of course, going to be one. Because in that situation, I've chosen door one. The car is behind door two, so Monty is stuck. Monty has to show me door three. Because door three is the only thing left that has a goat behind it. So that probability is one. And the probability, given that the car is behind door three, that Monty will open the door to show me that the car is behind door three, that probability is zero, because Monty definitely will not do that. Now, if we perform these calculations, we get one times one third divided by, now it's going to be one sixth plus one third, which is equal to one half. And this probability turns out to be two thirds. So, what we get is the probability of H2, given the information we receive, is two-thirds, but the probability of staying, or the probability that the car is behind door one, given the information that you receive, namely that Monty said that there's a goat behind door three, that probability is only one-third. So in fact, according to Bayes' theorem properly applied, you do in fact have an incentive to switch.